Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in. Today's word is going to come from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10, uh, specifically will be in verses 46 through 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. And the question for tonight uh, in this sermon that we're going to spell out the answer for is, what is Jesus? Now, I'm not mixing up my language there. That's purposeful. What is Jesus? Not who is Jesus? What is Jesus? And it's a pretty, it's one of those questions that you, you can take it a lot of different ways, but we're going to literally just look at tonight, what is Jesus? Before we get too, start, uh, too far down the path, I'd like to pray real quick. So, Father God, the opportunity to preach your word, to read from your word, and to learn from your word is not one that I take for granted and not one that we should take for granted either. I thank you, God, for this opportunity. I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that your word is true, that we may learn and grow from it. I humbly pray for your words to come through tonight, your lesson to come through tonight, to sink down into our hearts and take wherever we may go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Mark chapter 10 is the main place we're going to be. The question of what is Jesus? In Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30, we get a few ideas of what even those that were walking closest to Jesus thought he was. They knew he was a person, but what was Jesus? In Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27 and going through verse 30, we see Jesus with his disciples, starting in verse 27. Now, Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But what do you say that I am? But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. So right there, you get a little picture of some different things that people were thinking uh, Jesus was. Someone, uh, some people thinking that he was John the Baptist or that he was Elijah or just a prophet. But in Mark chapter 10, it's going to spell it out a little bit differently, starting in verse 46. Before we get to that, though, I was kind of curious. I've been a Christian pretty much all my life, been saved since I was seven years old. So I've had a pretty good idea of what Jesus is. I know who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the only begotten Son of God and crucified on the cross uh, as the sacrifice for my sins that a Gentile like me might know uh, salvation. But as far as what is Jesus, I was kind of curious, what do other people think Jesus is? And I, I did a little bit of research between other beliefs and just uh, worldly views of what Jesus is. And I found some pretty interesting things. What do non-Christian people think Jesus is? Some people think uh, that he was a, he, they say he was a rabbi and he was a popular teacher. A man with supernatural powers that were wielded thanks to the power of the devil. That's actually a sect of uh, a believing faith, uh, not a Christian faith by any means, but uh, a faith that I found uh, in some research that said they think he was uh, a man that had supernatural powers, but the only reason he had them uh, was because the devil gave them to him. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, others say a prophet, a holy man, an enlightened man. Uh, a moral teacher. Uh, some people think he was a completely made up figure. There's a lot of different ideas on, from people who are non-believers as to what Jesus was. But in Mark chapter 10 verses 46 through 52, we are going to see a picture of what Jesus is. So starting in verse 46, now they came to Jericho. This is Jesus and his disciples. Now they came to Jericho as he went out uh, as they, now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Verse 48, then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Verse 50, and throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So it's a pretty incredible story of a miracle performed by Jesus giving this man, uh, this blind man sight. Uh, it is a miracle that, that is seen in, in several of the gospels. This story of Bartimaeus is repeated in Matthew's gospel as well as Luke's gospel. A few details are a little different in Matthew's, but nonetheless, this is clearly, uh, it's, it's pretty cool when scripture, scripture uh, substantiates and, and, and repeats. You can tell it wasn't just something that one person saw, multiples did. But there's a very, there's a little line in there that gets lost, I think, if you just skim through it. And then when you really read back, you see what happened and how this ties into this message. And it's in verse 47, it starts in uh, verse 47. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now to someone just skimming through or just reading through, you might look at that and say, well, that's just another way to refer to Jesus. It goes deeper than that. It's gonna go much deeper than that and I'm gonna explain that to you. Starting off, I wanna give you a little background on this Bartimaeus guy. Uh, from the scripture, we understand he was a blind man and he was not uh, somebody that was a faker per se. If you're blind, if you if you are hobbled enough where you're out there begging for what little bit someone will, will give you because you can't work, you can't do anything else, rest assured it's it's the real thing. Bartimaeus is a man that is blind. He has nothing to his name. Scripture, none of the gospels speak to Bartimaeus being uh, some kind of man of means. Uh, he clearly did not have a family that he could stay with, otherwise he wouldn't be on the street begging. He didn't have anyone to, to take care of him. That's why he's in the position he's in, out on the what we would call the roadside, begging. He has nowhere else to go. He has nothing to his name. Uh, he has no status to speak of. He's got no, uh, you know, no royal tie-in or anything like that. And, uh, in verse 50, it talks about him throwing aside his garment. We'll dive a little deeper into that later, but throwing aside his garment, what that's going to tie into is, is uh, what he was wearing is believed by scholars to be a government-issued garment. It's a government-issued uh, coat or piece of clothing, if you will. So it's not even, it's not even really his own clothing. This was something that uh, beggars had to do in order to collect alms, to be worthy to collect alms. You know, we think of, we think of homeless people now, and most of the time you see them, and they, they have like those signs up that have th a message written on it. Uh, but this was what Bartimaeus had was, was clothing that was not even his own. Uh, it's hard to think of someone being any lower in life than this poor guy Bartimaeus. He's blind. He's poor, he, he pretty much has nothing of his own, and he is on the roadside begging. In verse 46, they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. So Jesus has a crowd following. He doesn't just have his disciples, but scripture says, and a great multitude. Jesus is performing these miracles and performing these signs people naturally want to follow. And just, you know, he's just amazed at what they're seeing here. They don't quite fully understand it, but they know this is something pretty amazing that's happening with Jesus. So Jesus has got a crowd behind him. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. It's the only way he could get anything. Being blind, this is not a time and day where today uh, we have these protections in place for people that 
have a disability or, 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 or blind or deaf or have a handicap, you know, we do a good job now you know, having opportunities for these people to still find some way to work. Back then, it just wasn't like that. If you were blind or hobbled like this, there really wasn't an option for you. There really wasn't anything you could do to earn. His only way to earn is to sit there and beg and plead people for, for anything they might throw him. So Bartimaeus, blind guy begging by the road while this big old crowd of people, this horde of people is coming by following Jesus. In verse 47, and when he heard Bartimaeus, and when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Yelling at a rabbi in this time, and probably still, probably still nowadays, but especially back then, yelling at a rabbi was considered uh, not just poor form, but uh, pretty much downright rude. You know, a rabbi or a, a teacher, if you will, was uh, someone of a, a very high standing. They were someone high up in the community, maybe not earning wise per se, but uh, they were someone to be respected. And uh, you don't really yell at too many people you respect, I don't imagine. So, but Bartimaeus was, was, was so in need, says he began to cry out when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Right there in that verse, you see two different ways that Jesus is referred to. The first one, Jesus of Nazareth, is uh, a more referring to Jesus as if he were just another man, just another common person. It has his name and it has where he comes from. You know, Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus, he was a Nazarene. It would be the same way in today's times, you would refer to me as Tyler of Ruffin or Tyler of Burlington. Uh, it's, it's my first name and it's where I come from. I'm a common man. But that first part there in verse 47 says, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. And the second name is where the, where the hit really comes. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So the scripture refers to this man, Bartimaeus, being told in his ear that, hey, Jesus of Nazareth is walking by. But when it's Bartimaeus' it's turn to speak and he yells it out, he acknowledges, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The difference in these two names, as we'll explain, one is referring to Jesus as if he's just another common man, the Jesus of Nazareth. The latter Jesus, son of David, is referring to him as Messiah because the Messiah was prophesied that he would be of the Davidic line. He would be a son of David. Acknowledging just this little thing saying Jesus, son of David, is to acknowledge that Jesus is the one prophesied about. We'll look at that Old Testament prophecy a little bit later on. But just this little turn of words, this little different wording to refer to Jesus speaks to the faith that Bartimaeus had in Jesus. Bartimaeus could not see this man, but yet he must be hearing the things that Jesus is doing of the miracles that Jesus is performing. If he hadn't been hearing those things from someone, he would have no reason to cry out to this man. But he's clearly hearing from somebody that, hey, this Jesus of Nazareth is, is healing people and he's bringing back their sight. He's curing lepers. Uh, he's, he's teaching in a miraculous way. And Bartimaeus, who can't be distracted by sight because he has none, has the faith inside to recognize this is the Messiah. This must be the Messiah, Jesus, son of David, referring to him as Messiah. Without calling him Messiah, he calls him Messiah by referring to him as a son of David. Verse 48, or, uh, just before in verse 47, I told you, you know, he, Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus. And when I say cry out, I'm not talking about you know some weak little whimper cry. We're talking about very loud volume shouting. And that's considered rude. It's considered rude to yell at a rabbi, to, re to yell at a, at a teacher. Then many warned him to be quiet. Many warned him to be quiet. Bartimaeus, uh, being in the position that he's in, 
is also seen as unworthy of bothering someone like Jesus. Jesus is performing these miracles, but to these common people, he's a teacher. And to bother the teacher, of all people to bother the teacher or the rabbi, this lowly beggar, this poor person that, that can't earn for themselves, that has to live off the, the, the table scraps and the alms, the givings of, of people. I mean, totally unworthy to call on Jesus, right? No. He's only unworthy to call on Jesus in man's eye, not in Jesus' eye. Then many warned in verse 48 to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. And he reaffirms what he says before in verse 47. He refers to him as the Messiah once again. Son of David, have mercy on me. He repeats himself. Son of David, have mercy on me. Another part of this is the belief that these afflictions that affected people were caused by sin. Uh, in John chapter 9, verse 2, and I'll flip there just real quick. You don't have to flip there if you don't want to. But in John chapter 9, verse 2, even Jesus' disciples believed this stuff. In John chapter 9, uh, and it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The belief was, back then, the disciples believed it too, apparently, because uh, his disciples asked him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The belief was that if you had an affliction, if you were born with an affliction, uh, or you just had an affliction, uh, it was a form of punishment by God. So, even more reason Bartimaeus isn't worthy in man's eyes to bother Jesus, to bother the, the teacher is, I mean, I mean, clearly you, you have this affliction because there is sin in your life. There is, there is sin in your family. You're really unworthy of bothering, bothering Jesus. He doesn't want to hear from a sinner like you. That's what man says. Bartimaeus doesn't care. This man is desperate, but he cried out, verse 48, he cried out all the more. So I'm sure he raised his volume a little bit more, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Again, referring to Jesus as the Messiah. To refer to him, to refer to Jesus as the son of David is to refer to him as the Messiah. And there's also the thinking, when you're seeing this, many warned him to be quiet. I got a feeling they weren't warning him in a very nice way. He was probably getting a pretty good rebuke. He was probably getting shouted down or what we call uh, getting blessed out. Nice way to put it. I'm sure he's getting blessed out pretty good by people, you know, man's understanding thinking that this sinner, this person who has so much sin in their life that they're born blind, they're born with this affliction, unworthy to go speak before the teacher, unworthy to yell at this man, unworthy to try to get his attention. Just shows just how lost, just how lost and how far away these people were. But he has called out to Jesus twice by verse 48, and he's referred to him as the Messiah both times. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus hears him in verse 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer and rise. He is calling you. I read that verse over and over and over again because it is just amazing. It would be amazing if, if, if you wanted to put yourself in Bartimaeus' shoes or whoever's shoes. Can you imagine being told this news that Jesus standing still commands you to be called and that those around you calling to the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer and rise. He is calling you. I've heard this referred by many different things, but my favorite uh, reference to this is the call of the master. Some people have heard that, the call of the master. It is literally the master calling Bartimaeus. 
is an incredible song I looked up that actually is called The Call of the Master. And in its lyrics, it says, Seek him though your eyes don't see. Like Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus could not see him. He was blind. Seek him though your eyes don't see. Listen while your ears can't hear. Bow down while your knees still bend. The master's calling. The master is calling. And this is the call of the master. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise. He is calling you can't think of a better place to be. Can you imagine with your afflictions and with your stresses and your problems and your sicknesses to be able to, to stand there and, and see that Jesus has acknowledged that he's heard you. He stopped in his tracks. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's got a crowd of people behind him. His disciples are behind him and he stops in his tracks and commands Bartimaeus, Come, be of good cheer and rise. He is calling you. The master's call is amazing. It is amazing to think of that. Verse 50, continuing on. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. I referred to that earlier, that this coat that Bartimaeus was wearing uh, most likely was not his own. We, we, the way we are with clothes in this country, we're, we're very spoiled. Clothes are very uh, relatively easy to come by in this country and in, the, in this time for us. But in a lot of poor countries, and especially in these times back then, uh, clothes were not just something you went and bought off the shelf. They, they didn't have Amazon back then. They didn't have uh, department stores back then. Your clothes were usually handmade. And, and, and what you had was what you had, you know, whatever you could afford and, and you had to make it last. Um, there wasn't no whole having 8 million different outfits to choose from. And uh, this coat that Bartimaeus was wearing was most, most likely issued by the local government so that Bartimaeus could collect what we call alms. Uh, he was issued this cloak. He's, he's, a, he's a blind person. He can't earn income on his own in this time. So what happens is he's, he's going to be a beggar. Everybody knows he's going to be a beggar. So what the government did was issue these coats uh, so that it basically was like legitimizing them uh, so that they, they could collect alms. What we refer to as alms are money or food given freely to the poor. This was referenced in Luke eleven forty one. We're not going to turn there, but... Um, that's what Bartimaeus is in need of. He's seeking the donation of alms. And he's wearing this coat that the government issued him, so he's basically legitimized. You know, there's actually, in the, in the city of Greensboro, North Carolina, they actually have laws and rules uh, for uh, uh, beggars or panhandlers, whatever you want to call them. You know, they can't, um, in certain places they can stand, certain places they can't stand. Uh, how close they can get to cars. They, they have these rules. I don't, I don't know how well they're actually enforced, but if you will, they have these regulations. And this is an example of a regulation in, in these times of, 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 of for a beggar, for someone who's going to be begging. And Bartimaeus basically seen as having no other choice. He's blind. Obviously being blind, there's not a whole lot you can do in these times. So he's going to be a beggar. But this action of him, he's been told to rise and be of good cheer because he's being called by Jesus and Bartimaeus throwing aside his garment. This thing, basically probably the only thing he had, this government issued garment, he throws it aside. He throws it away. By throwing it away, it's basically him saying, I don't need that anymore. That's being tossed aside. I'm not going to need that anymore. Just another symbol. Because if he didn't have faith, if Bartimaeus didn't have faith, that Jesus was going to perform some sort of miracle and be able to help him, he would have hung on to the coat. He would have hung on to that. He would have been. He would have probably gotten up and been like, "Well, I'll go see Jesus, but but I need to hold on to this coat because if I don't have this coat, I can't beg for alms. I can't beg for donations. I can't beg for money. I have to have this coat in order to continue this lifestyle or this. I hate to say lifestyle like it was a choice, but I have to have this on or else." I have no other way to collect anything. But Bartimaeus, throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. This blind man 
throws aside the only security blanket he has. And he rose and came to Jesus. It's not easy for a blind person in these times, in any time, but especially in this time. It's not easy for a blind person to just get up and go running. They might trip and hurt themselves or, 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 or fall or something. Bartimaeus, throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. He hears the master's call. He responds immediately. And with that simple act of throwing aside his garment, he demonstrates a faith in Jesus, continuing on the faith that he has already mentioned in the previous verses where he is referring to Jesus, not as Jesus of Nazareth. He is referring to him as Jesus, the son of David, Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 51, so Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Another thing that it is hard to wrap your head around. Can you imagine standing before Jesus and Jesus saying this to you, the Messiah, our savior, standing before you saying, what do you want me to do for you? And knowing that he can do anything. Such good stuff. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. It's the only thing he asked for. He doesn't ask for money. He doesn't ask for a home. He doesn't ask for anything but to be able to receive his sight that he may see. This term Rabbi that uh, is used in verse 51 is actually the same term listed in John chapter 20, verse 16, by Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, when she realized, uh, Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb after Jesus had been crucified. They had, they had, they had laid his body in the tomb, and Mary Magdalene was, was one of the women that was going and, and, and taking care of uh, Jesus' body. And that third day, she went to go uh, check on the body to, to go and, and take care of it. Wasn't no body there. There, that, that there was no body there for her to take care of. So she's in this state of just panic, like, where have they taken my Savior? And in John chapter 20, verse 16, when she realizes, she, you know, she looks up and she's speaking to Jesus, but she doesn't realize it's Jesus. When she goes looking for his body in the tomb, John chapter 20, verse 16, it says, Jesus said to her, Mary, with an exclamation point, I'm not going to yell at you. But Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned around and said to him, realizing it was him, Rabbi. So that's where this term also gets used. That's, a long, that's probably a long story to tell you about Rabbi, but I just wanted to clear that up. So verse 51, so Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. And in verse 52, Last verse of Mark chapter 10. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. He didn't go off to, he had nowhere else to go. But he could have gone anywhere he wanted to. He could have received this blessing and been like, I'm going to the casino or I'm going to the bar. Or, I'm going, yeah, I'm sure there was somewhere he could have gone. But immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road, on the road heading to Jerusalem. Your faith has made you well there in verse 52. And it is, this whole story is just an incredible picture of a person's faith. Bartimaeus did not just have uh, a faith that something has to come good of this. I have nothing else good in my life. It wasn't a, an empty faith. Uh, empty faith can be placed in a lot of different things, like uh, putting an empty faith in your sports team, saying, well, I mean, they, they done lost five games in a row. They got to win one at some point. You know, that's blind faith. But, but uh, Bartimaeus had an incredible faith, and it was, it's just incredible to think of someone who could not see Jesus having enough faith to recognize. Faith in Jesus as the Messiah. This is, I'm speaking about the kind of faith that Bartimaeus had. He had faith that not only was Jesus a mir uh, someone performing miracles or some holy man, he had faith in Jesus as the Messiah. 
as he demonstrates with his words in verse 47 and verse 48, as I told you, referring to Jesus as the son of David is to refer to Jesus as the Messiah. Faith in Jesus as the Messiah, as demonstrated in those two verses. Faith that Jesus is the one prophesied about in 2 Samuel 7 and Isaiah chapter 11. To refer to Jesus as the Messiah is not just, you know, we think of that word Messiah and we think of it, you know, you know Savior, all the other names that we call Jesus. But in order to, in, in referring to Jesus as the Messiah is to acknowledge that he fulfills the Old Testament prophecies that were given. Old te the entire Old Testament points to Jesus' coming. The entire Old Testament points to a time when God's only begotten Son will come to this earth and he will be the Messiah. Two of the places that that prophecy is mentioned, I'll take you to right now. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 14 through 16. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I'm going to read it for you. This is one of the images of prophecy of the coming Messiah. By referring to Jesus as the Messiah, as Bartimaeus did, he acknowledges that he fulfills the following prophecies. And there's way more prophecies than these. I just picked these two out. 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 14. I will be his father and he shall be my son. These are God's words. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. God was speaking to King David through a prophet, giving this prophecy. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. And with the blows of men, blows of the sons of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. That's what Jesus did. As in being of the line of David, Jesus is, Jesus is our Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, is another prophecy that Jesus fulfills being the Messiah. This is another thing. It is not just some simple thing, Bartimaeus referring to Jesus as the son of David. It speaks to him fulfilling prophecies like this one as well. Isaiah chapter 11, verses one through five, I'll read for you. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness, the belt of his waist. When Bartimaeus refers to Jesus as the son of David, as the Messiah, this is what he's referring to, that Jesus is the fulfillment of hundreds of thousands of years of prophecy. The nation of Israel waiting. When will this Messiah come? When is he coming? What will he do? What will he look like? Will he punish our enemies, the Romans? They wanted him to punish him. They wanted him to do all these things. He is the fulfillment of those prophecies. Speaking of Bartimaeus' faith, we're almost done. The faith to walk towards someone he cannot even see. This is not a great time of, of accessibility for people with disabilities. I don't know if Bartimaeus had a cane I doubt he had anything like a walker like we have today. He didn't have it. I doubt he had a CNI dog or uh, any of those things like modern, we have today, modern amenities for people with disabilities. Bartimaeus literally had to stand up and walk towards someone he could not see. 
And you, you might you might sit there and think about that like, well, I mean, how hard can that be? I tell you what, tonight, when you get up, uh, if, you, if you're laying in bed and you realize, hey, I'm a little thirsty. I, I want to go get a water out of the fridge. I tell you what, don't turn on your nightstand light. Why don't you get out of bed with your eyes closed and go walk to the kitchen to go get that bottle of water. But don't have your eyes open. That house that you spend every day and night in, that you know so well, I guarantee not having your eyes open, you're going to stub your toe, you're going to hit the wall, you're going to run into the door. Ah, oh, dang gun. You're not going to be able to find the fridge. Some simple task like that. Bartimaeus, blind from, as, as a blind man, had to stand up and go follow Jesus. He had enough faith that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was going to do something. He was going to perform. He, he, he was, he was going to be able to help him. No one else could help Bartimaeus but Jesus. He had enough faith to stand up and go walking toward someone that he can't see. Being blind, obviously, he, he, he hasn't laid eyes on Jesus. All he's been able to do is hear of the amazing miracles that Jesus is performing. And it's probably, it's one of those things that Bo talked about in one of his sermons about a, a blind man at his seminary who, because he was blind, didn't give a hoot what other people thought of the way he stood or the way he moved in chapel, you know, whether he moved or, 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 or shouted back. And, you know, he's a, he's a blind man. But being blind, he's not cursed with the, uh, there's, a, there's a thing that we have that we can see uh, it's the curse of, I guess, worrying what other people think of you. Bartimaeus can't even see that. He, he can't see what other people think of him or the scowls on their face or the, the laughing faces they might be or if they're pointing at him like, hey, look at this blind guy. He, can't, he literally can't see that. And because he can't see it, he can't be distracted by it and he can't be knocked off his path to Jesus. What an amazing thing that is. The faith to walk towards someone he cannot even see. John 20, 29 refers to that a little bit. Jesus was speaking to Thomas. Thomas, doubting Thomas, who even upon looking at Jesus, uh, you know, he says, yeah, I'm not going to believe it unless I can put my, you know, I can, I can put my hands in his wounds. And he finally sees Jesus and he finally believes. Doubting Thomas finally believes. John 20, 29, Jesus says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who better would speak to that than a blind man who believed that Jesus was the Messiah? It is one thing to refer to Jesus as a good teacher. It is one thing to refer to Jesus uh, as, as if he was just a good person. Uh, it is one thing to refer to Jesus as uh, someone who performed miracles and, and, and could cure ailments and diseases and, and blindness. But realize one thing. When you are referring to Jesus, when you are talking about Jesus, when you speak Jesus' name, he's not just those things. He's not just uh, all these things that, that I just listed off. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Jesus is the only one whose death on the cross could pave a way for a sinner like you and a sinner like me and a sinner like everybody you know to have the opportunity to have life in paradise. On the other side of this earthly life, when this, when this road finally comes to a close and our time here is up, whenever that comes, it is only by Jesus that we even have the opportunity to have everlasting life because we are unworthy of it without him. The only reason we have any ticket to punch to get into heaven is because of Jesus. And it's not just because Jesus could heal people and he could perform miracles and because he gave good advice. It's because Jesus was, is, 
and forever will be the Messiah. He's not just Jesus of Nazareth. He's not just Jesus of the Bible. He's not just that Jesus that Christians talk about. He's not just the Jesus that people reference in their, in their speech. If something goes wrong, if they curse his name in vain, he's not just the Jesus uh, that just happens to be in the history book. He's not just a rabbi. He is the Messiah. That's the point I want to make tonight. That's the main point of this message tonight. What is Jesus? If someone asks you, what is Jesus or who is Jesus? If they ask it that way, I hope that you will go forward and say, he is the Messiah. He is the one that was prophesied about, the one that we were told would come and did. And he fulfilled he did everything. He is the one that Isaiah 53 speaks of in the suffering servant. He is the one who could have been taken up into heaven. He could have called down uh, legions of angels to get him off that cross and spare himself of any suffering. But he stayed on that cross and he suffered a sinner's death, the worst death you can imagine being crucified. He took it for us. He took it for us. Jesus is not just a name and he's not just a word. He is the Messiah. I encourage you to take that forward with you. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. And thank you for Jesus, Father. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son so that a Gentile, a sinner like me could know grace. It is only by your son that I have any hope of being in heaven. I believe in your son. I admit that I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus is your son and that he is the Messiah. And I confess my sins, pray for forgiveness, and I repent my ways, Lord. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus because he is the Messiah. It is in the precious name of Jesus that I pray this prayer. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for watching.